Hello and welcome to GI 101. My name is Dr. Adriana Lazarescu and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. With me in the GI 101 studios today is my co-host for GI 101, Dr. Dan Sadowski. Dan, last week we began a discussion on the diagnosis and classification of esophageal motility disorders. What are we going to cover today? Well, I would like to build on the concepts that I introduced last week and discuss the most current thinking on esophageal motility disorders, which is the Chicago classification. Excellent. As well, I should mention that today's episode is probably more appropriate for advanced learners such as residents in gastroenterology or general or thoracic surgery, as we will be discussing some of the finer points of esophageal manometry. As well, I will be showing a fair number of motility tracings today, and these may not display well on a small handheld device. And you may have better visibility using a tablet or a laptop computer. Why don't we begin where we left off last week? Right, so I made the point last week that esophageal manometry analysis is really concerned with two principal factors. First, we are concerned about the EGJ. Is the resting pressure high or low? And does the EGJ relax adequately with wet swallows? Secondly, we are concerned about peristalsis in the esophageal body. Is peristalsis present or absent? Is the peristaltic amplitude high or low? And is there spasm? With the advent of high-resolution manometry, it's now possible to answer these questions with a great deal of precision. Three important manometry metrics have been developed to help us characterize the behavior of the esophagus. These are the Integrated Relaxation Pressure, or IRP, which is an assessment of EGJ relaxation, the Distal Contractile Integral, or DCI, which is an assessment of the overall peristaltic contraction force in the esophagus, and the Distal Latency, which is a measure of the presence or absence of esophageal spasm or premature contraction. Let's talk about how these three numbers fit together and help us classify esophageal motility disorders. Good question. And that brings me to the Chicago classification, which was first developed by Dr. Peter Carolis and his team at Northwestern University. It probably represents the most current understanding of esophageal motility disorders. This classification has undergone several updates since 2009, and in today's talk, I am actually referring to version 3.0. For a more in-depth description of this classification, I would refer the listener to the article by Dr. Kurilis in Neurogastroenterology and Motility in December of 2014. On this slide, you can see the Chicago classification scheme. It looks a bit complicated, but we will go through it section by section. What I like about this classification scheme is that it is hierarchical. That is, it goes through a thinking process in five steps that seeks to identify the most serious disorders first, such as achalasia. It also classifies the disorders nicely according to the three manometry parameters we talked about earlier. Are you saying that if I know the IRP the DCI, and the distal latency for a particular patient, I can then diagnose their motility disorder? Absolutely. Let's see how this works. Our first priority in step one is to look at the IRP. If the IRP is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury, it would suggest that the EGJ is not relaxing appropriately with swallows. That should raise our suspicions for achalasia. The next step then is to look and see if we have evidence for failed peristalsis or simultaneous contractions in the body of the esophagus. In those situations, the distal latency would be much shorter than 4.5 seconds. In the setting of an IRP with failed peristalsis or spasms, we have grounds to make the diagnosis of achalasia. Have a look at this example. Here we see simultaneous panesophageal pressurization of the esophagus with wet swallows. If we measure the distal latency, which we really don't need to do because it's obviously simultaneous, we find that it is zero seconds. And if we look at the orange pressure band at the bottom of the tracing, 
we see that it is continuous with no evidence for relaxation with swallows. If we measure the IRP, we find it to be elevated at 30 millimeters of mercury, definitely abnormal, so we can be quite confident in making the diagnosis of achalasia in this case. This tracing looks like type 2 achalasia to me. Yes, you raise a good point. And according to the Chicago classification, there are actually three types of achalasia, 1, 2, and 3. Each one of these has different manometric characteristics as well as different responses to therapy. We have covered these in a previous podcast session on the diagnosis and management of achalasia. Our listeners may want to review these again. What if you have an elevated IRP but normal peristaltic activity in the body of the esophagus? Yes, that leads us to step two. In this situation, we again have an elevated IRP, more than 15 millimeters of mercury, indicating lack of opening of the EGJ, but in this case, the distal latency is longer than 4.5 seconds, indicating that intact peristalsis is present. Here's an example where on initial inspection, it appears that peristalsis is present in the body of the esophagus, although you could argue that there may be some bolus retention present. As well, it appears that the EGJ does not relax with swallows. If we apply the manometry parameters, we see that the distal latency is in fact 4.6, which does indicate intact peristalsis. But the IRP is high at 19.5, indicating lack of opening of the EGJ. The Chicago classification calls this EGJ outflow obstruction. Some potential causes of this phenomena include distal esophageal stricturing from reflux disease, or in patients who have had a previous Nissan fundoplication, which is too tight. It is also possible that EGJ outflow obstruction may in fact be the initial presentation of achalasia. Now, if the IRP is normal, it leads us to step three of the analysis. These are the disorders of esophageal body peristalsis. A short distal latency in more than 20% of swallows is diagnostic of diffuse esophageal spasm. For example, in this tracing, on initial inspection, it does appear that the peristaltic contractions are rapidly conducted down the esophagus. If we apply the motility metrics, we see that the distal latency in all of these swallows is less than 4 seconds, diagnostic of diffuse esophageal spasm. Another category of peristaltic abnormality is where the DCI is abnormally high, that is, a DCI of more than 8,000. If this is present in more than 20% of swallows, it is diagnostic of jackhammer esophagus. This is a tracing from a patient of mine who presented for evaluation of severe crushing chest pain. You can see on the tracing that there are very high amplitude peristaltic contractions after swallows. The average amplitude in the distal esophagus is more than 500 millimeters of mercury, more than perfusion pressure. If we calculate the DCI, it turns out to be more than 54,000, which is possibly a world record. This is a classic case of jackhammer esophagus. And fortunately, the patient has responded very well to Botox injections. Whatever happened to nutcracker esophagus? I don't see it on this classification scheme. You are right. Nutcracker esophagus is one of those time-honored diagnoses that date back to the original days of esophageal manometry. The initial criteria were the presence of high amplitude contractions in the distal esophagus along with average amplitudes of more than 180 millimeters of mercury. It was thought that nutcracker esophagus was commonly seen in individuals who had non-cardiac chest pain of esophageal origin. It turns out that using these diagnostic criteria is a very poor discriminator between normal asymptomatic patients and patients with esophageal symptoms. A better term to use today would be hypertensive peristalsis, which reflects abnormal elevations in the DCI between 5 and 8,000. However, I should also point out that in the literature even today and also clinically, you will still see the term nutcracker esophagus used for historical reasons. More research is needed to know what degree of DCI elevation is predictive of esophageal symptoms related to hypertensive peristalsis. Another abnormality seen in the esophageal body is absent contractility. 
This is where there is no visible peristaltic activity in the esophagus after a swallow. This slide is a good example of that where there is no discernible peristaltic activity whatsoever after a solicited swallow. How would you distinguish between absent contractility and type 1 achalasia? That is an excellent point, and it is a potential diagnostic pitfall for the clinician. One would expect to see a normal or even high EGJ pressure in the situation of achalasia, particularly with a high IRP indicating failure of EGJ relaxation. However, it is possible in achalasia to have a lower EGJ pressure in the situation particularly where previous endoscopic dilatation has been carried out. A barium esophagogram may be helpful in identifying a dilated tortuous esophagus typical of advanced achalasia. Step four leads us to minor disorders of esophageal peristalsis. This is the situation where the peristaltic activity of the esophagus is ineffective, that is where the DCI is low, less than 450. If more than 50% of solicited swallows are less than 450, it is diagnostic of ineffective esophageal motility. Here's an example on this slide where the esophageal peristaltic contractions look feeble. And by the way, I also hope that you notice the hiatus hernia that's also visible in this tracing. If we apply the manometry metrics, the DCI comes out to less than 300 or less for each swallow, diagnostic of IEM. Incidentally, this is the most common motility disorder that we see in the GI motility lab. The final thing in this category is the situation of large breaks in the peristaltic waves more than 5 centimeters in length. If this happens in more than 50% of swallows, it is diagnostic of fragmented peristalsis. You can see an example of this in the tracing shown. Whatever happened to the term scleroderma esophagus? Again, this is a term that dates back to the origins of esophageal manometry. It describes the situation of totally absent esophageal peristaltic activity along with a low or absent EGJ pressure. While this situation can be seen in individuals with systemic scleroderma, it can also be seen in patients without any evidence for this disease. A better term to use would be absent peristalsis with low EGJ pressure. Thanks for that review, Dan. I hope that it has helped our listeners become more familiar with the current understanding of esophageal motility disorders. This concludes our podcast. See you next week. Bye. Bye.